and welcome back to another exciting edition of Money Talks. I'm your host, Michael Thomas, here and very excited to have a special guest today, Evelyn Lim. Evelyn Lim is the Region 8 Administrator for HUD. Not only that, she is also part of the task force responding to COVID-19 at the Department of Housing and Urban Development we know and love so well and call HUD. Evelyn, thank you for being on the show, and we're so glad to have you. Thanks for having me, Michael. My pleasure. So looking at your background, you know, before you came to HUD, you had uh, a background at the Department of uh, Homeland Security. And uh, we talked before the call about you had some disaster preparedness in that background. For the benefit of uh, our viewers, can you give us a little idea of your background and, and kind of what your role is today at HUD? Sure, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of strange, but uh, back in 2006, I was uh, working in the Bush administration at the White House. And so we actually did the first uh, pandemic strategy back in 2006 and worked on the implementation plan for the strategy in 2007. So coming back full circle uh, at HUD, uh, when Secretary Carson was added to the task force in early March, my headquarters called me up and said, hey, you have the background for this. Uh, I did a lot of uh, disaster response and recovery at DHS as well. Uh, FEMA is one of their, uh, of their agencies. And so all of that came together and they asked me to come to headquarters to lead uh, the HUD response to the pandemic. So it's a role that I'm still doing now, uh, although I am easing back into my Region 8 duty. Great. And just for the benefit of our viewers, tell us a little bit about the states you cover for HUD in uh, Region 8. Sure. So we are the Rocky Mountain region. We cover six states of Colorado, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, and North and South Dakota. So as I like to say, we, we put the rural in housing and urban development here in Region 8. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> like that. So uh, go, going back to this this response and, you know, the pandemic and HUD's response, can you give us an idea? I mean, clearly, you know, we've all seen pretty large uh, business and civic disruptions. Um, some industries more so than other. Obviously, obviously, retail has been hit very hard in, in many sectors, restaurants, etc. But um, can you give us an idea from, you know, your initial response uh, from from a HUD point of view and how that's evolved over these, you know, several months that we've had to respond and kind of deal with things as they change? Sure. Well, in very early on, we were very concerned about people who were uh, the communities that we serve and uh, the illness hitting those communities and how we would respond, as well as we wanted to make sure that people were able to stay in their homes because we understood the impact of the economic downturn. So uh, early on in March 18th, uh, FHA provided a uh, moratorium on evictions and foreclosures for single family homes. Uh, that eviction we've extended several times until the end of, uh, or, or that, that policy we've extended to the very end of uh, this, this calendar year. And that's something we did with uh, FHFA in coordination with them so that our, all of our homeowners would have work, be working from the same policy. So through the CARES Act, we have received $12.4 billion to assist our, our communities. Most of that went to our uh, Community and Planning Development Office, which received $9 billion. And those are the uh, programs and grants that go to the state and local entitlement communities. Uh, those people would be familiar with our CDBG, ESG, and HOPLA programs. Uh, $1 billion went to our housing office, which the majority of that went to the tenant-based rental assistance for uh, and through our 811 and 202 programs, which help the elderly and disabled. And then finally, $2.2 billion went to our public and Indian housing office. And a lot of that went to operational costs, they're the office that uh, uh, works with our public housing authorities. Uh, they are able to use that money for preparing, responding to uh, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And so those were the, uh, the large amounts of money that we received through the CARES Act. 
Great, great, great. So if I'm going to pull it back from the 30,000 foot view level, it sounds like a lot of the money that HUD had went out the door to really keep people in their, in their living environments right during the pandemic and not have to now also go find housing on top of everything else. Right, absolutely. Uh, and the great thing about HUD funding is that it really is up to the local communities to utilize it for how they need the funding. So in particular, our community planning and development grants, that was the $9 billion that I mentioned. Communities can use that money to respond in any way. We've been encouraging our grantees to utilize that for rental assistance since we know that that is a, um, a urgent need right now. Yep. And as someone that was formerly on a, on a city board in Aurora, where we would vote on the allocation of those funds, CDBG, home funds, ESG, uh, and I know that comes out typically annually from HUD, was this pushed out like very quickly after it was enacted or, or how did the money get to the local governments? Absolutely. So the CARES Act uh, stipulated uh, ways for us to allocate the money. So the first tranche that was $3 billion for the CDBG uh, and ESG, we used our regular formula. So uh, it was actually one week after that was signed that we were able to allocate those monies out the door. And then since then, we've done uh, two other applications of CDBG dollars. Uh, the last one being a, a different formula that was up to the secretary, where we really looked at community impacts and how um, the pandemic has affected these communities. We wanted to make sure that uh, we were able to utilize the money appropriately in the right communities. And we didn't want to uh, just also just be looking at, you know, the East Coast and the West Coast. We wanted to make sure that all of our funding was being allocated appropriately throughout the United States. That's great. Yeah. And hey, kudos to you for getting that money out the door so quickly. That is uh, really needed um, in these types of environments. So um, that's, that's fantastic. I wanted to ask you, you know, I work in the multifamily sector as well. I know in your world, that's just one of many things that you oversee and do for HUD. But I was curious because I've been reporting on unprecedented volumes that have been occurring uh, during this low interest rate environment in multifamily. Uh, what's been the impact that you've seen in your region to your pipeline? How are you managing it? Are, are you doing anything differently? Uh, give us an idea of, of what that's been like currently. Sure, yeah, well, we're, we're seeing the same thing. So the SHA platform, their book of business has increased dramatically uh, up to four times what it was in FY 2019. And so um, our risk share business also has more than doubled in FY 2020. Um, and so that is increasing our affordable housing production, which is, which is good. I think one of the big questions that we looked at uh, at the very beginning of this is that we, we knew affordable housing was an issue uh, going into the pandemic. And so we wanted to make sure that we uh, kept this supply line going for when we get to the other side. Of, of the prices. And so we've done a lot in terms of allowing uh, a lot of virtual uh, closings and uh, things like that, where we would normally say, you need to come in and get something notarized. We've, we've, we almost immediately changed a lot of that. So we've had a lot of successes in, um, in Region 8 in particular. We're able to uh, refinance um, a lot of existing loans, which benefits, um, you know, the, 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 eventually the people who are living in, in these uh, buildings because the cost savings that, um, that come from the refinance, as well as um, renewing Section 8 contracts, which ensure long-term affordability as well. So we, we continue to move forward. We continue to do a lot of work. Uh, in the region. And I think it's just a testament to the team that we have here. I, I can't take the credit for that. That's, that's all our multifamily office. Um, but, but we've, we've been uh, doing a lot. So that's good. We've, uh, we've certainly seen that on our end. And um, it's, it's great to see that we're able to 
really continue to move forward in this environment. And, and like you mentioned, the virtual and some of the early workarounds were, were extremely helpful. So that's, that's good to hear. Um, pulling the lens back to uh, asset management, you know, in addition to the 11,000 or so mortgages in multifamily that HUD has nationally, you know, there's also uh, assisted living, skilled nursing, board and care facilities. Clearly in this uh, pandemic, you know, doing site inspections and things like that were a little bit uh, more challenging. Um, how has that response, um, how did it start? How has it changed? And where do you see it going uh, as we move forward into maybe even a post-COVID world? How, how will HUD address, you know, the asset management regarding site inspections and things like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, very early on, we made the decision to uh, stop our REACT inspections just for the health and safety of both our inspectors, but also the uh, individuals who are living in these units. We didn't, know, um, we didn't want to be the ones spreading this deadly virus, particularly with uh, some of the populations that we serve, which are elderly and higher risk. So uh, the secretary just announced, well, uh, in August, he announced that we would be resuming REACT inspections and we would be looking at one, uh, those uh, units that are uh, higher um, in terms of they are um, have higher scores or, or lower REACT scores, meaning that there is an issue with that property, as well as looking at the location and what the virus is doing in that area. And so we felt like we have to do some risk management for uh, both the inspection process as well as ensuring that these homes are still uh, safe and um, and uh, and livable. And so what we're doing is, is when we announced it, we said we would uh, have a, a, a bit of a grace period. So those will be resuming soon. And we, uh, in full transparency, are putting that up on our website so people can see uh, what locations, based on Johns Hopkins data, that we um, feel are uh, okay to go in in terms of the virus. And then we will be looking at the REACT scores, the historical REACT scores to pinpoint uh, the, the units that we'll need to inspect. And we'll you know, be doing that uh, with a lot of communication so that people are aware, but also with all the protections that, um, that are necessary in terms of uh, going into somebody's house, making sure that we're wearing masks and gloves and um, minimizing, you know, any sort of uh, risk for the virus in that way. Right. So it sounds like more of a return to, you know, previous in-person type inspections is, is what's occur occurring. Is that right? Um, yeah. So right now, I think uh, that's, that's the idea. We want to make sure that we're still living up to our requirements to ensure that people have uh, safe and livable homes. And so that's what we'll be doing based on the scores. Um, but I think that it won't be our full regime that we know that people are used to uh, just because of, um, we want to be uh, extra careful for these populations to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, in an area where there's a high transmission or community spread of the virus. Of course. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I guess we're all wondering, I mean, this is kind of a very broad question. I'm not going to hold you to it, but you know, we're all wondering in the industry uh, from architects to developers, designers, people that own and operate assisted living facilities, people that own retail and commercial and, you know, have public spaces. I guess the question is, from a disaster preparedness point of view, how does this change how we move forward in the future? I mean, are we going to, you know, change some of the ways that we gather? Are we going to change the uh, actual configurations? Or are we going to just take different precautions? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, kind of the future and moving forward once we get past this immediate, you know, outbreak uh, going forward? How, how does this impact uh, what you do at HUD? That, that is a great question. I don't know if I'm uh, prepared to answer it because we're still dealing with the pandemic. I think that there is a, a definitely a lessons learned period that we will undertake uh, based on all of things. And I think there are certainly a lot of things that we could, that we have instituted 
that we could um, make long-term policy. And I know um, for that, that you know, applies for, for how we operate at HUD, as well as um, some of the things that we've required of our grantees and uh, you know, looking at all of those impacts as well. So, you know, it's hard to say. I think that there's, uh, it's a little naive to think that this hasn't changed how we operate. Um, you know, that, that maybe a vaccine, we would all come back into the office the next day. I don't think that that's the case. Uh, and so we'll definitely have to look at it. But there are things that we can certainly do in terms of looking at how the workforce uh, operates. Uh, you know, we've, we've been very successful in, um, in working remotely at HUD. And we're actually all still uh, remote now. Uh, we're all on either mandatory or maximum telework for our HUD employees. And so um, I think we've been very pleased with how our employees operate in this, in this environment. And, and I think that will go very well for how we look at um, operating operating costs and um, and uh, telework policies going forward. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I was looking at something a couple of weeks ago and they had published companies that have changed their, you know, remote policy to allow more work from home. You know, clearly everybody has pretty much temporarily, but then I was surprised to see that quite a lot of the companies have already permanently changed to a telework force. And I just found that that very interesting. Um, they are mainly technology companies, which you know can clearly operate in that environment. But I thought that was interesting. So I guess we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, going over to the special populations and some of the special incentives and programs. I mean, there's so many things that HUD does that I think most people aren't aware of. Whether it's for homeless veterans or you know low to moderate income or low income. Um, just on and on, lots of different things. Are there any programs or grants or benefits or things that we could uh, be aware of now that might be sort of hot topics for some of our viewers? Sure, well, I, I love that question because actually Secretary Carson was here just on Tuesday to announce an expansion of eligibility and additional funding for one of our programs, which is the Foster Youth to Independence Program. So that really helps uh, foster youth who are aging out of foster care. Uh, HUD helps them uh, through a voucher. We also work with the um, health services to uh, give them support. And then, um, and so that they really, you know, when you're 18 and aging out of foster care, I don't know if you're, um, if I was ready at 18 to be out on my own. And so uh, this program, we've seen a lot of, um, We've helped a lot of, of youth, um, you know, stabilize and get on that path to self-sufficiency. So that's just one of the things that I think is is great. We do a lot with the, um, we have a mainstream housing choice voucher program, uh, which we award to housing authorities to provide affordable housing to non-elderly people living with disabilities. Um, and we uh, we were awarded additional funding for that under the CARES Act. Uh, we also have our HUD Dash program, which is for veterans, um, and they they basically uh, get a voucher, but it's specifically for veterans, so they don't have to compete with um, for our other uh, housing choice vouchers. And then um, and, and then again, just just rental assistance, uh, which is so important right now as uh, we see that unemployment benefits expiring. Uh, which a lot of people were using that to pay the rent, um, you know, I think that we'll see more and more uh, of uh, having issues for rental payments as, as those benefits expire. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, I mean, as far as the eviction moratorium goes, how, how do you see that playing out going, going forward? Sure. So our eviction moratorium uh, uh, under the CARES Act is Fired in, in July, but um, as you know, the CDC released um, under their authorities, uh, their public health authorities, this uh, eviction moratorium until the end of the year. So it doesn't mean that you can't pay your rent. If you can pay your rent, you should, but, um, but it means that people who cannot pay their rent won't be evicted. Uh, they're still responsible for their rent, so um, 
you know, at some point they'll have to pay that back. And I think that we'll, um, we'll just have to see what is coming out. I think we have a lot of communities that are using their CDBG funds for rental assistance. And so um, in those communities, I think that that will be a really uh, good kind of safeguard for people who are um, having problems paying their rent. And we really are encouraging our grantees to utilize those funds for those things. Um, and just in the larger context, there's so much federal money out there that you can utilize for um, other disaster um, um, programs. So, you know, FEMA has a lot of money, Treasury provided a lot of money. And, um, and so we're hoping that our, our grantees will utilize HUD funding for rental assistance. Yeah, that's great. That you're doing so much. And I guess nobody really knows, you know, after moratorium goes away at some point, whether it's next year, or, you know, early or later, we don't really know. Um, I think the concern that us, the, us in the housing sector feel are, you know, people that may have lost jobs. If those job losses are permanent losses, for example, the retail store they worked at closed or the restaurant closed permanently, you know, how do we get job retraining? How do we get how do we get that part of our, our economy employed again? So I don't know if there's any uh, thoughts on that topic, but that's something that um, I think would be great to sort of work on just, you know, as a country really is focus on how do we kind of retrain part of our workforce potentially that may have lost some jobs permanently. Yeah, absolutely. And that is one of the things that, that HUD does regularly is work with our grantees. Um, you know, we just released our section three uh, final rule, which requires HUD grantees to, um, to employ uh, people who uh, receive a HUD subsidies. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's one of the great things where we build into our program with ability for uh, the people that we serve to get these ladders of opportunity. Uh, get retraining, get workforce development, get in, back into the workforce. And so that's one of the positive things that we've, we've been working on even pre-pandemic. Uh, but, but yeah, it is, it is a, it, it's, it's a great question because um, I don't know if, if, I certainly don't know what is on the back end of, of, of this and whether it is a, a, um, a gradual recovery from the virus um, or if it's it's a more of a you know we've got vaccines on the street and we're and we're ready just to get back to it. I think we're probably somewhere in between, uh, to yeah. be honest. Um, and so what that means for the economy, um, we'll we'll just continue to do our work here and 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 try to address this as best we can with our population. Yeah, that's great. And you said that's called Section Three. Is that the name of that? Yes. At HUD, we don't have come up with clever names. We just yeah. provide. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> sure you do. 221D4, that's very catchy. <laughs> right. Section of the National Housing Act. Um, no, that's fantastic. Um, I, I've, I've really been impressed by HUD's response. Um, I've been impressed by what you shared today. I think our viewers learned a lot. I'm really <laughs> glad you came on. So I'd like to thank you for coming on our episode of Money Talks, Evelyn. It was great to see you. Absolutely. Thank you. Wow. That was such a great episode. I was really glad to have Evelyn Lim on, learned a lot about HUD's response, disaster preparedness, and then how the agency sees itself moving forward post pandemic. Uh, great episode. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Michael Thomas, signing off.